Witching for a Miracle, written by Tegan Marr, narrated by Merritt North. Chapter 1 I laughed as my best friend Emma shoved me forward along the snowy path that led from the school to the center of town. We're so totally up the creek without a paddle if Principal Larson finds out we're the ones who did that. Well, since we're the only witnesses, I guess we're in the clear then. We turned around to take one final look at the school fountain. The lighting reflected festively off the newly colored Christmas green plume of water erupting from the center. Our home ec class had decorated around it earlier with red bows and garland, but it just hadn't looked complete to me. That's when I'd hatched the plan, then shared it with Emma, who'd embraced it with open arms. Cody, my straight-laced boyfriend, had been a little harder to convince. As my Aunt Addie would say, he'd been as nervous as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs while we were adding the green food coloring to the water, but had finally relaxed once we were within a couple of blocks of the diner and a half mile away from the school. I nudged him with my elbow. So, how does it feel to be one of the bad kids? He tried to maintain his frown of disapproval, but couldn't. He burst into a grin. A little weird, but... That fountain really does look cool. He leaned down and gave me a quick kiss. A little thrill ran through me that had nothing to do with the remnants of adrenaline from the prank. I was still dumbfounded that such an amazing guy had picked me. The pinks and blues from the neon lights shining from the windows of the diner lit Emma's face as she rolled her eyes. Jeez, get a room, you two. She stomped the snow off her boots and pulled the door open. The warmth of the diner felt great after we'd just walked for a mile in 30-degree weather. My stomach rumbled as the smells of bacon and hot coffee permeated my half-frozen nose. The Starlight Diner had been a gathering place for teenagers and adults alike since the mid-50s. Becky, one of the owner's daughters, and the fourth member of our little group rushed over to us. Oh my gosh, Shelby, y'all did it, didn't you? She whispered her green eyes sparkling with excitement. Why, whatever are you talking about, Rebecca? We've just been out for a stroll, admiring the Christmas decorations around town, I replied as I peeled off my coat and slid into a booth. Oh, bull, Shelby, don't feed me that. She had the best alibi ever if we got busted, but have no doubt that she was just as guilty as we were. She'd provided the commercial-sized bottles of green food coloring purloined from her mama's baking supplies. She slid onto the red fake leather booth across from Cody and leaned in. What does it look like? Did you take pics? Emma rolled her eyes. Oh, sure. Uh, we just snapped away, then went ahead and uploaded them to Instagram. Oh, and we did a Snapchat with my mom, too. She was real proud of us. She shoulder-bumped Becky. Of course we didn't take pics, dingbat. Becky raised a brow. Keep it up. I'm the one bringing your food. Baloney. You know you wouldn't. Em narrowed her eyes at her. Would you? Becky gave her a smug smile. Hmm. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Maybe you ought to be nice to your waitress. She propped her elbows on the table, a move her mama would have smacked her for if she saw it. Fine. Are you guys eating? My stomach was past the point of patience and growled again, this time loud enough for everybody to hear it. Cody laughed. I think that's a yes. I nodded. No joke. Walking all the way to the school and back made me hungry. Will you ask your mom to make me my cheeseburger? I'm starving. By mine, I meant a bacon cheeseburger with avocado, jalapenos, tomato, and extra mayonnaise. Cody wrinkled his nose. I swear you only eat that because you know nobody else will ask for a bite. I gave him a half grin. Nah, that's just a bonus. Becky went and told her mom we were there and returned carrying a tray full of ketchup bottles. She plopped down in the booth and married them while we talked about the fountain and the upcoming class Christmas trip to the Georgia Aquarium in Atlanta to check out their annual festival of the season. We'd raised money all year to go, and it was going to be the highlight of the school year. 
Becky's mom brought our food out to us, and just as I squirted ketchup on my plate, my phone dinged with an incoming text. My sister, Noelle, wanted me to grab bread on my way home. I looked at the time at the top of my phone and gasped when I saw that it was 9.40. Em, we only have 20 minutes to get home. My mouth was watering as I gazed longingly at my burger, but there was no way I was going to be able to get everybody home in time if we finished our food. Taking it with us wasn't an option, because as far as the parental units knew, we'd been at the diner for the last hour. Plenty of time to have eaten. I couldn't think of a valid excuse to fill the missing time. The thought of abandoning the juicy, oozing burger with the tips of crispy bacon peeking out from the edges of the bun made me want to cry. Both Emma and I had missed curfew last night, though. Being late two nights in a row wasn't an option. Cody and Em groaned but started to get up. You know, I told Emma thoughtfully, Cody's car is already at my place, and his curfew isn't until 10.30, and Will's out of town. Will was Cody's uncle and guardian. We could scarf down our food, then haul butt to the farm. I'll pull around to the barn where Noel won't see us, then just port you home. By port, I meant teleport. I'm a witch, and so is M, but she doesn't really have the ability to move from one place to another, at least not as well as I do, so I'd have to take her. I don't know, she said, doubtful. If something goes wrong, you could get in big trouble, or something could happen to us. That's a pretty new trick for you, and you've never taken anybody else with you. I'd been working hard, unless you asked my sister, to master my powers, because unlike most witches who had a chance to grow into theirs, mine had been bound when I was young, which is a long story for another time. Anyway, they had sort of attacked me all at once when I took a serious hit to my head last summer. I was getting pretty good at porting, though, and had confidence. I scoffed. Every time I've done it in the last month, I've been dead on. Come on, aren't you hungry? She stared at her chicken tenders wistfully. Yeah, but, but nothing. Eat. Cody spoke up, his eyebrows drawn together in concern. Shell, I don't think that's a good idea. Em's right. You're already on thin ice with the council, and that's a pretty complicated spell. What if you don't get it exactly right? He was referring to the witches' council. I was currently being tutored, translate, babysat, by Camille, Im's mother, who was a member of the Magical Oversight Committee. I bit into my cheeseburger, getting a little irritated. I can do the spell just fine, and we're not gonna get caught, I said, around a mouthful. Just eat. They didn't look convinced, but dug into their food. We scarfed down our dinner in just over five minutes and jumped in my car. By the time we pulled into my yard, we had three minutes left to get M home. I pulled around the side of the barn and M jumped out and met me in front of the car. Text me later, I told Cody and gave him a quick peck. You text me as soon as you're back here and both of you are safe, he told me back, worrying his bottom lip. Stop worrying! I grasped Em's hand, then centered myself and pictured the sidewalk outside of her house. I pulled the spell together and felt the magic swirling around us. Just as I uttered the last words, Noel screeched my name from the porch. It grabbed my attention at the exact second I should have been directing all of my focus on our destination, but it was too late to stop the spell. I shut my eyes and hoped for the best. Emma Rose Payne, what in tarnation do you think you're doing? I heard Camille yelling at the same time I landed with a thunk, startled both by her voice and by something wiry poking me in the butt. I opened my eyes and my heart dropped to the floor. Instead of appearing on the sidewalk out front, we landed square in the middle of M's living room, right on top of the opened box of Camille's brand new, unassembled, fake Christmas tree. 
And to make matters worse, Aurora Darkmore, the president of the local chapter of the Witches' Council, was sitting on the couch, her glass of eggnog halfway to her mouth. I was so dead. Chapter 2 I heard M squeal and assumed she was suffering the same pin-cushion experience I was. I struggled to get out of the box, finally rolling onto the floor and shaking off a couple of the top-tier limb pieces that had wrapped around my wrist in the struggle. Of course, when I pushed myself up, more of the limbs tumbled out onto the floor and made an even bigger mess. I didn't realize until I managed to make it to my feet that the room had gone silent. Camille was staring at us, well, at M, cringing and wide-eyed, with her hand over her mouth. Aurora looked thunderous. She slammed her eggnog down onto the table so hard that the sticky contents splashed over the side, then pulled M's granny's Christmas afghan off the back of the couch and marched toward us, holding it out and looking to the side. What the heck? Turning, I looked at M and groaned. She was standing there in her bra, doing her best to cover her girls with her arms and a piece of plastic Colorado blue spruce. She snatched the afghan from Aurora and fled to her room without looking back. Camille was glaring at me with her arms crossed, and Aurora was terrifyingly emotionless as M's door slammed behind her. It's totally not M's fault, I said, with my hands out. This is all on me. It was my idea. Of course it was your idea, Camille bellowed. It's always your idea. I'm not saying that Emma doesn't pull her fair share of knot-headed shenanigans, but this, this has you written all over it. Dangerous, reckless, arrogant. Transporting two people is difficult for an experienced witch, let alone one who has barely learned to light a candle with her magic. She pointed toward the door, so disgusted she wasn't even making eye contact. Just go, Shelby. I can't even look at you right now. What if you'd left behind something other than her shirt? You know, like her arm? Tears welled in my eyes as I looked up the stairs at Emma's closed door. Aurora's gaze was stony, and Camille's was so angry that I just wanted to shrink into a ball. I had to make her understand I didn't mean it. I'm sorry, I said, tears running freely down my cheeks, blurring my vision. It was an accident. She just shook her head. No, Shelby. It wasn't an accident. An accident, by definition, is unavoidable. This was just you being overconfident and screwing up. She heaved a sigh and shook her head. I'm calling Noel. You can wait on the porch. Don't you dare try to magic your way home, or I swear I'll bind you here and now. And don't call M. I think it's a good idea if you two spend some time apart. Resentment bubbled in my chest as I walked out the door and settled on the top step. The Christmas lights wrapped around the porch posts blinked merrily, and I just wanted to rip them down as I thought about the events of the last twenty minutes. It's not like I landed us in Peru, for cripe's sake. Okay, so maybe I should have listened to M and Cody and just eaten the grounding for being out past curfew, but... What was the point of having magic if I couldn't use it? I sat there and stewed for the fifteen minutes it took Noelle to get there. I had no doubt she was going to take a strip of hide off me, too. Yay. When she finally pulled up, I shoved to my feet and trudged to the truck. She pushed the door open from the driver's side, but didn't say anything when I got in. She just waited for me to buckle up and then pulled away from the curb. We made it almost all the way home before I couldn't stand the tension in the car anymore. Just get it over with. She glanced at me out the corner of her eye. Get what over with? The butt chewing. I know it's coming. I can see it on your face. She lifted a shoulder. Why'd you do it? 
Why not just cowgirl up and take the grounding for being late? Do you understand what could have happened to either or both of you? I crossed my arms and glared out the side window, clenching my jaw. Of course I know what could have happened, I snapped. But it didn't, did it? Magic always carries a risk, but I've been practicing. I would have landed us just fine if you hadn't hollered at me when you did. So, this is my fault, she asked. I could tell by her tone this wasn't the time to keep pushing. No, it was nobody's fault. I mean, yeah, it was my idea, but I didn't do anything awful. I missed my mark by a few yards and missed pulling her shirt along with us. It's not that big a deal. I really did understand exactly what could have happened, and just the thought of it made me shiver. But being talked to like I was ten was getting old. Do you have any idea what went through my mind when I walked down to the barn and saw poor Cody standing there holding M's shirt? I felt your magic all the way up at the house. I don't know why you think you can hide something that big from me. But when I saw him holding that shirt, I about lost my ever-loving mind worrying that one of the hundred awful scenarios flashing through my brain was what had really happened. She turned her head and studied my face as we pulled up in front of the house. The colored lights that Noel and I had strung along the eaves and porch railings twinkled. A light snow coated them, giving them a soft, cozy glow. But the holiday good cheer of just a few hours ago was completely gone. Now, they just seem to be mocking me. Nobody's out to get you, Shelby, she said softly, reaching out to brush my hair back off my forehead. I turned my head away and shifted my body so she couldn't reach me, but didn't look her in the eye. Well, it sure doesn't feel that way. Every time I try to do something even a little bit grown up, all I get is grief. Why can't you respect that I'm almost an adult? I fought to keep the petulance out of my voice because I wanted a real answer. Oh, sugar, there's a huge difference between being almost an adult and being one. Yeah? Well, I'll trade you places then. I pushed open the truck door and jumped out, nearly plowing over Max, our talking donkey, on the way. Hey, watch where you're going, you impotent child. He took a pot shot at me with a back hoof, and with the way the night was going, I was surprised he missed. Noel called out to me before I made it to the door. Chill out in your room for a while, then we're going to talk. I pushed the door open so hard the pine cone wreath crashed to the floor. I snatched it up and shoved it back on the hanger, then bolted past the brightly decorated Christmas tree straight to my room. Chapter 3 I flung myself on my bed, but was too anxious to sit still. My room was huge, and at first I paced, but then, as I cooled down, I started to think. My eyes fell on the antique snow globe that Noel's friend Sarah had given me the year before. It was right after our Aunt Adelaide had passed, and I'd been so lost. Sarah said it had comforted her when she needed it most and hoped it would do the same for me. Surprisingly, it had. When Addie showed up a couple of weeks later as a ghost, it was the happiest day of my life. She was pretty much the only mom I'd ever known. My real mom, her sister, died when I was four. Noelle remembered her, but all I had were flashes. When Sarah gave it to me, Noelle said that any time I ever needed a quiet place to go, just shake the snow globe and pretend I was skating my worries away on that pond. Since then, I'd used it as a kind of thinking piece. I flipped it upside down and watched as the snowflakes drifted silently onto the village, coating the shoulders of two couples skating on a pond in the center of town. Sure does look perfect in there, doesn't it? I jumped when Addie appeared beside me. Since becoming living impaired, as Noelle liked to say, she'd pretty much lost her respect for boundaries. Yeah, it does, I said, not taking my eyes from the village. It's not, you know. There's no such thing as perfect, baby. At least, not in the way you think of it. 
every dog has a few fleas. No matter what she said, it looked a whole lot better than here. There was a man sitting on a bench beside the pond, watching the skaters. I always thought he looked a little out of place, because he wasn't smiling and carefree like all the other people in the snow globe were. He looked more... thoughtful, I guess. A little dog lay on the bench beside him, resting his head on the man's leg. Well, I know for a fact nobody thinks I'm perfect, I said. They all pretty much think of me as a screw-up. Even M. She stayed in her room when Camille threw me out. I had to wait for Noelle on the porch, and it was freezing. Tears welled in my eyes, and I brushed them away, irritated that I was letting it get to me. She said I had to stay away from M for a while. Addie heaved a sigh that was a habit left over from when she was living. Sugar, don't nobody think you're a screw-up. We're just worried about you, because you sure don't seem none too concerned about yourself. You could have killed M tonight, or yourself. You know that, right? I lowered my eyebrows and focused on the snow globe, fighting tears. I was used to Noelle getting her tail all twisted, but Addie was usually on my side, or at least not against me. And I know why. You were Russian, too. I glanced up at her, startled. Me and Belle. Belle was the former owner and current resident ghost of the Clipping Curl Beauty Parlor. Well, I looking at Christmas lights and saw you three sneaking up the hill to the school and decided to follow. I gave the snow globe another good shake. Awesome, I said, voice flat. You gonna rat me out? She moved closer so that I had to look her in the eyes. No, but I am going to punish you myself for lying to Noel. Schoolyard hijinks are the least of your problems right now, and I don't want to give the council any more ammunition, but it does fit a pattern shell. It's almost like you're trying to get into trouble. I just don't care. What's going on? Nothing, I mumbled. I'm almost an adult, and I'm sick and tired of being treated like a little kid. Well then, she said as she started to fade out, maybe you should stop acting like one. For a long time after she was gone, her words echoed in my head. I glanced back down at the ice skating couples and the happy little town that surrounded them. Families were building snowmen together, and the warmth of the lights glowing from the windows of the Victorian buildings made me want to go inside. It seemed so welcoming, and they all looked so happy. Thoughts of Cody drifted through my mind. I wondered if he was mad at me, too. I leaned my head against the windowsill and imagined it was the two of us ice skating on that pond. No curfews, no nagging, no witch's counsel, no punishment for stupid stuff. Just us and all the time in the world to explore that adorable, perfect little town. I felt the swirl of magic around me and started to panic. I hadn't called upon it. I put the globe down and tried to rein it in, to stop it, but I felt the pull of the vortex that accompanied a port, and everything went dark, as it always did. Chapter 4 The first things I noticed when the fog began to clear were that I was teetering on what felt like two tight ropes, and everything was blindingly white. I flung my arms out to balance myself, but was too late. I landed on my backside with a solid thunk so hard my teeth rattled. The ground beneath me was hard and cold, but I took a minute to look around before trying to stand. A familiar voice sounded behind me. Shelby, what did you do? Where are we? It was Cody, and like me, he was sitting on the ground. Unlike me, he looked pissed. The cold was seeping through my gloves and snow was gathering on my eyelashes. I realized we were sitting on ice. I held up my finger to silence him as I took a minute to examine our surroundings. 
Snow blanketed everything, the pine trees, the buildings, the pond we were sitting on. The pond! Oh, crud! My shoulders sagged. We were in my snow globe. I turned to him and cringed when he glared at me. I think, maybe, I ported us into my snow globe somehow. Scrunching my eyes shut, I waited for his reaction. You what? It sounded like you said you ported us into your snow globe. He was looking around, clenching his jaw as he realized what he was seeing. I mean, he'd never paid much attention to mine in particular, but the structure of snow globes are pretty distinguishable. A whoosh of air passed me and the other couple, the couple that was supposed to be there, skated by, nearly taking off my fingers. I scowled and jerked my hand back. Hey, watch it, I yelled, but they didn't so much as turn around. We need to move, Cody said as he pushed to his feet. I tried to follow suit, but it felt like I had on lead shoes. I groaned when I saw why. I was wearing skates that were so white they matched the snow, with little red pom-poms on the toes. In fact, we were both wearing the same red snowsuits as one of the two pairs of skaters had been, and there was only one other couple besides us on the ice. No way this was happening. Do you know how to ice skate? I asked. He was already standing and reached down for me. Yes, I do, though I have to say I never thought I'd be using the skill to keep somebody from chopping my fingers off on a pond inside a snow globe. I took his hand and let him haul me up. I couldn't risk looking at his face to see if he was kidding because it was all I could do to stay upright. Plus, I couldn't take the disappointment that was probably written on his face. Come on, Shell, he said as I almost fell for the third time. It's not much different than rollerblading, and I know you can do that. Oh, sure, it was just like that. Not, but I could hear a trace of irritation in his voice, so I tried a little harder. Using him as a brace, I managed to scramble to the side of the pond and up the bank to a cast-iron bench painted Christmas red. While I was catching my breath, I checked out our surroundings. It looked way different from this perspective. The couple skating on the pond never looked away from each other as they jumped and dipped. The families, building snowmen together, smiled and worked as a team, and the townspeople decorating the giant tree in the town square hung each bulb and string of lights just so. Even the carolers were perfectly in tune. Everything was exactly as it was supposed to be, except something was missing. I looked around again, paying attention to each detail. It was the man. We were sitting on the bench the man usually sat on, the one with the little dog. I looked around. He was nowhere in sight, but everything else was exactly as it should be. Why would he be different? Then, before I could give it more thought, reality struck. We were in a snow globe. Nothing was how it should be. It was a model of a town, not a real town. Nobody should be moving. Christmas lights shouldn't be twinkling. Carolers shouldn't be singing. Skaters shouldn't be skating. Cody was staring around, but I couldn't tell if he was amazed or terrified. Or both. Okay, now that we're not in danger of losing fingers to the dipping duo out there, would you please tell me what's going on? I pushed down the panic and looked at my folded hands, then up into his eyes, begging for understanding. I don't know. One minute, I was sitting in my window, thinking how perfect it looked in here, and how I wished it were me and you out there on the ice. And the next, well, the next, here we were. He scrunched his eyebrows together in a gesture that I'd come to recognize as his thinking expression. Give me some context. Why did you wish that? Start with what happened after you ported with him. All I know is Noelle came running outside mad as a wet hen. Then when she saw the shirt, I thought she was going to pass out. I took him through the whole story, starting with how Noelle had distracted me and I'd accidentally landed us in Camille's living room, right up until we landed on the ice. It was an accident, I finished, and it sounded old and lame, even to me. 
He searched my face for a few seconds, then sighed. Well, at least you can get us out of here, right? I chewed my lip. I wasn't sure whether I could or not, but I didn't want to tell him that. It wasn't like I'd just ported us from one place to another. I'd called him from a distance, shrunk us both, and animated the entire snow globe. I was proud of my progress, but I had no idea where to even start because I had no idea how I'd done it. Right? He prodded, his brows up. I pasted a cheery smile on my face, if for no other reason than to keep my fear at bay. Of course I can. But since we're here anyway, uh, let's chill out for a little bit, I said, hoping to buy myself some time. After all, it was my mess, and I was perfectly capable of fixing it. I just needed some time to think about it first. He looked around, a worried frown creasing his brow. I don't know. I think we should probably go home. My face dropped. Come on, can't we spend just a little bit of time in here before I have to go back and deal with Noel and Camille? I'm probably not going to see daylight for months by the time they're done with me. Will's out of town, so it's not like you'll be reported missing. I saw the moment he gave in and smiled. You suck. You know that, right? He smiled and shook his head. Stuck in a snow globe. Definitely not an experience I would have considered a possibility six months ago. We'd met when I was magically skipping stones across Keyhole Lake and he busted me. That wasn't too long after he lost his parents, and he'd been there for the same reason I was. Solitude, and a place to think without people asking questions or expecting anything of him. Yeah, I sighed and laid my head on his shoulder. Me neither. I shrugged off the woe-is-me feelings as it finally sunk in that we could do whatever we wanted to do. In there, we were adults. I took his hand and headed to a corner of the pond where the sliding slashers didn't seem to go. Now, teach me to ice skate. After all, that's what I'd come there to do. Chapter 5 It didn't take me long to get the hang of it, and soon we were skating hand in hand, avoiding the other couple, and having a blast. We'd been on the ice for probably a half hour when I skidded to a stop after racing him across the ice. I almost face-planted into the bank, but he caught me. I'm parched, I said, out of breath as I steadied myself. Let's go find something to drink. We will, but first I want to show you something. He took my hand and pulled me closer to the other couple, but near the edge, where we wouldn't be in the way. We were standing beside a small pine tree that was decorated with red and silver ribbons. Little clusters of snow tipped the end of each branch, just like everything else in here. It was picture perfect. I said as much. He tilted his head and looked at me for a second, then pulled me in front of him and rested his chin on my shoulder. Look at their path, he said, motioning to the couple. Look at their faces when they come past. They skated by and performed a complex jump and twirl, then skated to the other end and back around, then back and into the same routine. Their expressions never changed, and they never averted their eyes from each other. They just skated and smiled at each other. I gasped when I realized what he was trying to show me. He gently let go of me, making sure I was stable first, then went to the tree and pushed it over. Honey, there's no such thing as your concept of perfect. I know that's why you pulled us in here, and you've mentioned it several times, but what you imagine just doesn't exist. No matter how great something looks on the surface, there's always something at least a little off. But perfection is in the eye of the beholder. I think you're perfect. Everything about you makes you the girl I love. Warts and all. I wrinkled my nose. Ew. I get the concept, but can we say freckles or something instead? He laughed and kissed my nose. I make a grand declaration and reveal one of the great truths of the universe, and you pick out the word wart. See, that's one of those wart freckles I was talking about. The ability to completely pick out what you want to hear and nothing else. Come on, Agatha, he said, 
dodging me when I swatted at him. Let's get you something to drink. We headed back toward the bench and collapsed onto it, and the missing man flitted through my mind again. Once we sat down, though, the problem of how to unwork my spell to get us out of the globe popped back to the forefront of my mind. I bent over to unlace my skate, trying to recapture exactly what I'd been thinking and feeling when I felt the magic. Somehow, that was the key. Cody cleared his throat and looked at the socked foot I'd just pulled free of the skate. What you gonna put on once you take those off? Ah, crap on a cracker. He was right. I'd magicked us in here wearing skates. I was just glad that I'd thought of warm clothing, even if it was in the form of 70s-style jumpsuits. Maybe one of the shops has shoes, I said. He leaned back on the bench and crossed his legs, his skate resting on his knee. He grinned, and I wondered again how I'd gotten so lucky. Oh, yeah, he said. Did you happen to bring your Winter Wonderland visa with you, or should I just put it on my Magic Village MasterCard? I slapped his skate, but smiled back. There's no need to be a snow globe smarty pants. I think I have an idea. I placed my hands over my skates, summoning the magic I'd need to turn them into regular shoes. He took my hand and touched my face. Sweetie, I think it's time to go home. Dread clawed at me, and I kept working and reworking the pieces of our predicament in my head. Not only was I unsure about how to get us out, I wasn't exactly thrilled about going back to face my fate, either. I'm sure they had a grand punishment cooked up for me. The happy feelings I'd had since we landed in the globe faded away into resentment. Still, it's not like I could hold us in there forever. Surely by now they'd had a chance to realize how badly they'd overreacted. I squeezed his hands and confessed my fears about the magic involved. The spell has to be different, more complicated than just porting. And I looked down at our hands. I don't know if I can get it right. Well, what do you mean it's different? I mean, somehow I did more than just port us in here. We're three inches tall, or I guess we are. I pulled you all the way from your house, and we literally took the place of the skating couple I'd wanted to trade places with, clothes and all, when the magic happened. I slapped my forehead. Oh, man, I wonder what I did with them. My voice was rising in pitch, and I was talking a mile a minute. With who? he asked. The skaters! Did I pull them out? Or did I just make them disappear? My mind rabbit-trailed, chasing all the possibilities. He snapped his fingers in front of my face to get my attention. Rude, I said. He rolled his eyes. Yeah, okay, whatever. But you need to focus. What were you feeling when you worked the spell? I thought about it. I was mad because everybody thinks I'm a screw-up and because I'm tired of never getting any respect. I lowered my voice, and he had to lean forward to hear me. I was also worrying you'd finally reached the end of your rope with me. I wished that we were in here with no outside pressure or hassle. He ran a hand over his hair. I think we need to figure out another way. No offense, but I don't want to risk leaving behind any critical parts. I looked around at the fake town full of fake people. They didn't look so perfect anymore. I'm not seeing any other options. Besides, I got us in here, so I have no doubt I can get us out. Just give me a few minutes to think about how to organize the spell. He looked doubtful and opened his mouth to say something. But before he could, the ground shuddered and a cloud passed over us, taking it from full daylight to dusk inside our little bubble. I jumped to my feet and pulled fistfuls of defensive magic into my palms. Chapter 6 The cloud obscuring the light slowly came into focus, and suddenly I wished it hadn't. I took a couple of deep breaths like Camille had taught me and released the magic, then looked up into one of the four faces on the planet I did not want to see right then. No else. 
and if the color of her face was anything to go by, she was about to give me both barrels. I groaned and closed my eyes, preparing myself mentally for the battle I knew was coming. What in the name of all the holy have you gone and done now? She put her nose down so close to the globe that little twin plumes of fog covered a quarter of our sky. I tried to answer, but apparently the glass was one way. Nice to see my lucky streak was still holding. I couldn't even defend myself. She stood back, and two more faces took her place. Nice. Now, we had three of the four. Camille glared down at me, but Addie put her hand on her arm, or tried to. Noelle stepped back into sight. We all just need to calm down. I don't think this was anything she did on purpose, Addie said. Camille humphed. That about sums up her life recently. A whole string of accidents. Look where the coddling got her. She flung her hand at us. Locked in a snow globe, and she dragged Cody along with her. Now, what are we supposed to do? You know she's not going to be able to clean this up on her own. I don't even know if Aurora will be able to do anything about it. That went through me like a hot knife through butter. I was sick of being talked down to. I may have made this mess, but I was going to clean it up, too. I grabbed Cody's hand and let my rage fuel my magic. They were going to see once and for all that I wasn't the child they all took me for. The Christmas lights inside the globe dimmed and the lamp in my room flickered. Noelle frowned and realized what was going on. She narrowed her eyes and pointed that stupid mom finger at me. Shelby K., don't you even think? I tuned her out and pictured the two of us in my room, clothed, whole, and full size, and felt the magic melding to my will. It felt right. The vortex built, and I felt my reserve drain. I only had one shot at this, and it was going to take everything I had to get us both back, but I poured everything I had into it. Just as the magic pulled us through, something grabbed my ankle, and my focus shifted. A brilliant white light flashed, and for just a split second, I felt a weird sense of comfort mixed with... elation? The vacuum of space sucked us through, and we were on the other side. Except something wasn't right. And not in a look-we-landed-on-a-bed-of-hundred-dollar-bills way. Surprise, surprise. Chapter 7 The fog cleared, and Cody and I were back full-sized, but still wearing the tacky red snowsuits. Two out of three. I'd take it. Addie, Noel, Camille, and Ray were staring back and forth between Cody and a little brown dog with a big, heart-shaped patch of white hair over his left eye, eyes wide. I frowned. Where did the dog come from? Some scruffy old guy, like forty-five or something, whom I didn't recognize came up from behind me, scaring the bejesus out of me. He knelt and called to the mutt, who came running, and tried to jump on him, but went right through him instead. I'm so sorry, he said to me when the dog sat down and cocked his head at us. I think I might have thrown a wrench in the works. My family moved in to hug Cody, but Addie was the first one to ask about me, probably because she couldn't actually hug him. It's all well and good you're back, but where in the Sam Hill is Shelby? And where did the mutt come from? She looked at him suspiciously. Oh, dear, sweet baby Jesus. Rayanne, our cousin and Noelle's best friend, gasped. She done went and turned herself into a dog. Noelle and Addie did a double take at the pup, and Addie swooped in to get a closer look. To his credit, the little dog held his ground, even though he could obviously see her. Aurora, a large woman who enjoyed wearing turtlenecks year-round, don't ask me why, because they did nothing for her figure, pushed forward, nearly knocking No and Ray down. Don't be ridiculous. Give me the beast. 
the little dog hunkered down and growled at her. Don't try me, mutt, or I'll turn you into a cat. The dog seemed to understand because he stopped growling. He didn't exactly look pleased, though. Green Light pulled at Aurora's fingertips and she wiggled them over the dog. Reveal, she commanded. Everybody stayed still and watched for a few seconds until the pup poked his nose out and licked her hand. Noelle shook her head. Nope, definitely not Shelby. She'd have bit her. I stepped forward, irritated. All right, ha ha, I get it. I was stupid, again. But don't ignore me. Noelle, you know that makes me crazy. I was really starting to get ticked because that's what she used to do when we were kids and I was being annoying, or she was being mean, whichever. The look of concern on her face was real, though. Noelle, can you sense her? Addie demanded. I started to get scared when my sister froze and schooled her face into the expression I'd come to know all too well over the last few months. She was reaching out to me with her mind. She wouldn't be doing that for real just to mess with me. They really couldn't see me. Usually, as soon as she started psychically knocking, I felt her familiar presence. Not this time. I looked back at the man who was apparently only visible to me and growled. I'll ask you one time. What did you do? Why can't they see me? Why can't she talk to me? And why is your dog visible, but we aren't? Are you some kind of crazy evil spirit or something? Hysterical laughter bubbled into my throat, and I threw up my hands. Like you'd admit to being an insane evil spirit. God, Shelby, I said to myself, get a grip. I can explain, he started. I held my hand up, silencing him and turning my attention back to Noelle. That little worry crease between her eyes was on full display. Lately, it was there almost constantly because she sweated everything. Seriously. Like she couldn't let anything go. It was irritating because before Addie had died, she'd been a different person. She'd been carefree. She'd driven too fast. She'd laughed all the time. She ditched class sometimes. I know, because I caught her a couple of times and blackmailed her for rides to the movies. Now, she was just a fun sponge. She had no concept of spontaneity or risk-taking. She'd gotten better at it since she started dating Hunter, the local sheriff, but she was still pretty buttoned up. All eyes were back on Cody, but he was looking wildly around, calling my name. He held his hand out toward my family helplessly. She was just here. She was holding my hand. Ray's face lit up and she stepped back over to my window seat. She is probably still in the snow globe. You know her magic is spotty at best sometimes. And that was a doozy of a spell she just tried to pull off. Camille and No joined her while Addie hovered over the top for a bird's eye view. They picked the globe up and turned it gently so that only a little bit of the snow poofed up. When they realized I wasn't in there, No, Ray, and Addie started talking at once, throwing around ideas and what-ifs. Something felt off as I watched them, but it took me a couple of seconds to put my finger on what. I couldn't sense any of their emotions. Camille looked shaken, but she yelled over them. Ladies. Panicking won't help. We need to calm down and look at this rationally. We need to start with how they ended up in the snow globe to begin with. Cody? Cody stepped forward and gave the Reader's Digest version. Yes, I know what that means. I'm young, not illiterate, or culturally delayed. When he finished, Camille pinched the bridge of her nose. Okay, so when you left the globe, what did you feel? Were you holding her hand the whole time? When did you stop feeling her hand? He concentrated. I think I felt her hand right up to when we landed here. I was still holding it when I opened my eyes and saw you guys. Then nothing. 
Oh, I do remember hearing the dog bark right as we got pulled away out of the glow, and there was this huge flash of white light. Throughout the whole story, the four women listened without interrupting. So, after I said hello to you guys, I turned to congratulate her on a spell well done, but she was just gone. Camille's eyes were troubled. This is really not good. Noel, who always seemed to have a handle on pretty much everything, asked, Why? What are you thinking? Do you know what happened? Do you know where she's at? I'm not sure, but I think so. Yes. When she paused, Ray made the rolling, get on with it gesture. Spit it out, we ain't got all day to find her. Camille cringed. Actually, I don't know if you can find her. I think she's stuck between the two worlds. Addie blew out a relieved sigh. Oh, the in-between. Well, then, there's the answer. I'll just go looking for her. That's my world. No, it's not, Aurora said. You're on an entirely separate plane from the one she's talking about. It's an earthly plane, or at least, sort of. Imagine a page of a book. You open the book, and there's page one. That's where we... She motioned to all the living people in the room. Exist. You turn the page, and there's page two. That's where you exist. But there's that tiny little sliver of paper between them. That is where we think Shelby is. Okay, Noel asked. So, how do we get her back? Addie spoke up this time. I've heard of this before, but thought it was just a fairy tale to keep young kids entertained and to teach a small life lesson. I had no idea it was a real thing. Oh, it's real, all right. Rare, but real. It was a topic in one of my magical errors classes at the Academy. The problem is that, according to all the documentation, you're not supposed to be able to come back from it. It's a void. Well, Noel said, that's kind of good news then. If there's one thing Shelby's good at, it's doing things she's not supposed to do. I just have to keep faith in that until she figures out a way to communicate with us. I moved up to hug her and my arms just went right through her like Addie's do ours. I turned to the guy and sighed. Like it or not, we were in it together so I needed all the information I could get in order to come up with a plan. Cody and the girls shuffled out of my room with the little dog lagging behind, looking at us. Come on, boy. I don't know who you are, but you are staying with us for a while, Ray said, then flipped the light off behind her. He followed, but was still glancing over his shoulder. Noelle flipped the light back on and looked around my room, as if she were searching for something. Me. Leave it on, please, just in case. With a final glance around, she pulled the door shut behind her. Chapter 8 As soon as the door closed, I spun on the man. fan flippin' tastic what did you do? Whatever it was, you messed everything up. You heard her. Nobody's ever gotten out of this before. Tell me everything. How did you get in the snow globe to begin with? How did you know that Cody and I were going to port when we did? Why didn't you approach us when we first got there? He looked down at his toes as I fired off the questions, and the shadows of his face stirred my memory. I pointed my finger at him. Wait just a doggone minute. You're the dude from the bench beside the pond. He took a deep breath and released it, then motioned toward my window seat. He took a chair next to it. Sit down if you want the entire story. It's gonna take a minute. Well, it appears as if time is the one thing we have more than enough of. I was probably a little more sarcastic than I should have been, considering I was stuck in some in-between plane with a guy who might be a serial killer. But really, could I even die anyway? Let's just start with the basics, he said. 
What town are we in? You're kidding, right? He just looked at me, waiting for the answer. We're in Keyhole Lake, Georgia. He puffed out a little sigh of relief. Good. I thought so, but I needed to make sure. It's not like it's something you ever talk about. My name's Gary, by the way. I held up a hand. Hold up there, Gary. The way you said that kind of implies you know me. He looked at me like I was a little slow. I've lived in your snow globe for right out a year, if I've managed to keep track of the days right, though sometimes time skips around in there some. It's not exactly like I was eavesdropping, but if you were standing close to the globe, I could hear you. And, man, no offense, but you're kind of a whiner. I looked at him suspiciously, ignoring the jibe. You could just hear me? He nodded. Yes, just hear. I mean, I could see you when you were looking into the globe, and it was a pain in the backside when you shook it. But the rest of the time, you were just a voice. Anyway, he continued. I bought the snow globe originally for my wife Melody on our wedding day almost a decade ago. She collected them, but that one was her favorite. I found it at a junk shop. His lips quirked up into a sad smile. I think it was just sentimental value. She was diagnosed with leukemia a couple of years ago and passed away right before Thanksgiving last year. He paused and looked at the globe, lost in memory. All I could do was look at that stupid snow globe and wish that I had her back again and that we were one of those couples on the ice, together and happy. Looking back, I was so lost in my own grief that I didn't even stop to think about how horrible it was for our daughter. Movement outside my window caught my eye. Cody was walking around in the yard, and he looked totally lost. I noticed it was daylight out instead of dark, and Gary's comment about time skipping around in there penetrated my brain. I needed to hurry this along because we'd already lost at least one night. I rolled my finger at him. Okay, skip the gooey parts and cut to the place where you got sucked into the globe so I can fix this hopefully before Cody leaves. You know, that's one of your biggest problems. You're selfish. It's always about you. I'm sitting here telling you that I've been locked in your snow globe for a year and that my wife died just before that, and all you care about is that your boyfriend is leaving. I sighed. I'm sorry. I just don't see the relevance. How is that going to help get us out of here? He just shook his head. You really do have a lot of growing up to do. Before I could protest, he started speaking again. One day, I was looking in the globe, pining and holding Levi, that's my dog, and the next, I was sitting on the bench in the snow globe. I've been there ever since. How did you end up in there? I heard part of your conversation with your Aunt Addie, but what were you actually thinking when you were zapped in, and how did Cody end up in there with you? It was weird to me that he knew so much about my life that he called the people close to me by name. He must have known what I was thinking because he raised his brows. Hey, it was no picnic for me either. Seriously, I knew teenage girls were flighty and egocentric, but you gotta be the queen. You have no idea how glad I've been a few times when you finally quit woe is mean and turned off the lights. My brain tends to focus on random details when it's working on something in the background, like it was doing now. So, how did you eat and shower and, you know, all of that while you were in there? He raised a brow. Of all of the things that have to be rattling around in your head, that was the question you chose to ask first? He scratched his nose. The answer is that I didn't. It was like time was suspended, sort of. I didn't get hungry, I didn't sweat, I didn't even grow a beard. I started to think how weird that was, but then remembered we were talking about being locked in a snow globe. Weird was subjective. Let's go see what's going on with my family. Maybe they've thought of something. I headed to the door and reached for the knob, but my hand passed right through it. Holy crap, he said. For a kid who's so book smart, you ain't got much common sense sometimes. We don't have a form on this plane. He pushed past me and walked right through the door. 
I scowled. I'd have figured it out. Sure you would have. He stopped to let me pass, then followed me to the kitchen. Noel and Ray were sitting at the table with their heads in their hands, and Addie was floating above them. Well, he said, it doesn't look like any mountains are getting moved in the next half hour. I'm going to go see my daughter. And how exactly do you reckon you're going to do that? We can't exactly drive, you know? Yeah, I do know. I also know we're not on the physical plane, so those laws probably don't apply to us. He was still smirking as he faded out of sight. Chapter 9 A short while later, Addie's friend Belle showed up, and the four of them spent two hours tossing suggestions back and forth. The problem was obvious. I wasn't alive or dead. I was just... I don't know what I was, but I wasn't on a plane where either side could reach me. Noelle dropped her head in her hands and began to sob. I rushed over to her, but wasn't able to do anything other than stand there helplessly. This is all my fault. I should have taken more time and found a way to make her understand how dangerous magic can be. She just kept pushing the boundaries, and... Ray frowned and put her hand on Noelle's shoulder, and I was glad. She'd make her feel better. Tell her it wasn't her fault, she had to work, and that I was almost a grown woman who could fend for myself. You did everything you could, sugar. Don't you dare beat yourself up. You've worked two jobs to manage this place and take care of her. We all tried to get her to understand magic is no joke, but she's so hell-bent on proving how big and bad she is that it didn't matter what any of us said to her. In her mind, she knew more than any of us did. Hey, that wasn't true at all. I looked to Addie. She hovered over Noel, frowning. Rand's right, honey. Wait, what? Shelby's a good girl. She's just headstrong and hasn't matured enough yet to appreciate what others do for her or understand that we have her best interests at heart. I blame myself for spoiling her. Camille snorted as she pulled open the fridge to refill her tea glass. You two need some perspective. Shelby makes her own choices. She's no dummy. She knows exactly how dangerous magic is, she said as she filled her glass. She just thinks the rules don't apply to her. I don't know how she got them sucked into the globe to begin with, but she had the four most powerful witches in Keyhole Lake here to find a way to safely get them both out. But as usual, she was damned and determined to prove she knew more than we did. Ray nodded. I love her, but Camille's right. We were right there, but before we had a chance to find the best way to do it, she had to show off. It doesn't make her a bad kid, just an immature one that, so far, has been lucky enough that her pranks haven't hurt anybody. I felt like somebody had hit me in the forehead with an axe handle, but at the same time, I hung my head. If I was honest with myself, I knew they were right. That stung. I started to feel sorry for myself, but Gary's words about my woe is mean drifted unbidden through my head. I'd been such a bratty jerk, and now it might be too late to make a change. Gary popped back in right then. Hey, princess, you look like somebody just took your favorite teddy bear. I relayed what they'd just said about me. He humped. It's the absolute truth. You're way too big for your britches. They mollycoddled you and didn't let you learn your own lessons. That's how people learn humility, consideration for others, and consequences. Oh, and how to respect your elders. He waited a few seconds, then added, And my trip to see my daughter was a flop. Thanks for asking. Apparently, they've moved. I'm sorry to hear that. I said automatically, not really paying attention to what he was saying. Tears welled up in my eyes. Was he right? Were they all right? I thought back over the last year or so since my magical problems had started. I didn't get full use of them until I was 16, and everybody was so far ahead of me. 
M already knew how to use hers, though she was still finding new talents. When my powers were unbound, I was already taking classes with Camille because sometimes they would break through the binding and things would go sideways. Glasses would break, I'd swing my hand and the dishes would fly from the table or some other disaster would happen. Then, when I got full control, they still made me take lessons, even though things came easy for me. But was I really that bad? I thought to the incident last night with M. If I set aside my ego for a minute and looked at it realistically, that could have gone really bad, and I hadn't considered that before I did it because I was so sure I had it handled, and what was worse was she hadn't wanted to do it. I'd bulldozed her into it. I thought I was just being confident, but she'd had magic longer than me. She knew. The women had been talking in the background, but Emma's name caught my attention. Noelle had asked Camille how she was. She's gonna be okay. Thankfully, it was just a patch of hair that got left behind with her shirt. It'll grow back. What had happened to Em? I stepped closer and waited for more explanation and was startled when Noelle apologized. I am so sorry, Camille. I felt her magic stir and I yelled for her, but she was already gone. Don't you dare apologize for Shelby's behavior. She's 17 years old. The alarm on Noelle's phone chimed, and she shut it off and pushed to her feet. I have to get to work. Bobby Sue tried to make me take the evening off, but what can I do different here than there? Plus, they're going to need the extra hands. Gary's little dog had been sleeping at Noelle's feet, but he raised his head when she stood up. When he caught sight of Gary... He hopped up and trotted toward us, whining and wagging his tail. Ray raised a brow. What's he doing? I guess to her it looked like he was getting excited at thin air. Her gaze traveled to the wall behind us. There's nothing on the wall. She peeked out the front curtain. And there's nobody outside. Addie's gaze sharpened. What if she's here? Noelle spun around and stared right at me, or I guess through me. Shelby, are you here? If so, please, find a way to let me know. Move something if you can. I reached out and tried to move Camille's tea glass, but my hand just passed right through. I growled in frustration and tried again. It's not going to work, Gary said. I've tried half a dozen times. I turned away, dejected. Chapter 10 For lack of anything better to do, we decided to follow Noelle to work. It seemed we were the only two beings on this plane. Small blessings, I guess, but it only gave you one person to hang out with, too. In the scheme of things, though... It would have sucked to be dodging serial killers or evil spirits while I was dealing with some serious come-to-Jesus moments. When we got there, I followed Noelle over the waitress station. While she was tying on her apron, Bobby Sue hustled out from the kitchen and gave her a hug. Any news yet? No stuffed her server book into her apron pocket. Nope, not so far. Not even a glimpse. She paused. I think she's around, though. The little dog that came back with Cody has acted weird a couple of times, barking or whining at thin air. You know, they say dogs are sensitive. I wish we knew where he played into all of this. What kind of dog? Just a little brown mutt, except he's got the cutest little heart over his eye. She pulled the pickup on herself. Bobby Sue frowned and rubbed her chin. I know that dog from somewhere. Noelle shrugged. I've never seen him before. He's a cute little thing. If only he could talk. Well, if there's anything I can do, you just let me know, sugar, she muttered, lost in thought as she headed back to the kitchen. Sure thing. Noelle went off to take an order, which was boring, so I followed Bobby to the back. I'd been coming and going from that kitchen all my life, but I still liked to watch her and her husband Earl cook. That man was a genius with meat. Any news? 
he turned the meat slicer off and waited for her to answer. No, Septon, I think I recognize the dog that came back with Cody. What dog? When he reappeared, he had a little brown dog with a heart-shaped patch over his eye. He stepped to the swinging door that led to the dining room and poked his head out. Noel must have been standing close to the door because he barely grunted, in true Earl style, for her to come back there. She had a roll of silver garland in her hand when she stepped in. Oh, what you need? Show me the pic of that dog. Gary had joined us in the kitchen when Earl had called for Noel. He was all excited. I forgot Earl's going to recognize him. We used to take him fishing with us all the time. She pulled it up on her phone again and handed it to him. He looked at it and took a huge breath. He pinched his lips together and looked at Bobby Sue. You should recognize him, he told her. That there's Gary Rossi's dog. The one had up and disappeared with him last year. The color drained from Bobby's face, but Noel just looked confused. Who's Gary Rossi? The name's familiar, but I can't place it. That's Sarah's uncle. He disappeared straight out of his room last year, a couple of months before Christmas, and his little dog, too. That's Bonnie's daddy. Sarah was the other girl who worked with us at Bobby Sue's. She had her own little boy, Sean, and was raising her five-year-old cousin, Bonnie. Now that they explained, I knew exactly who they were talking about. Okay, but now the question is how Gary and his mutt are related to Shelby, or at least to the snow globe, right? Earl nodded. Yep, that about sums it up. Gives you a place to start anyway. Might try asking Sarah at the party tonight. Gary glanced over at me. What party? I slapped my forehead. Tonight's their annual Christmas party. They get together. Yeah, I, I remember. Earl dresses up as Santa and everybody brings a covered dish. Somebody always brings the most incredible apple pie shine. I smiled. Yeah, that'd be Ray, the dark-haired girl that was at my house. She makes it every year for Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. I got into a batch of it once. I felt kind of like hurling, just remembering it. It was delicious going down, not so much coming back up. He chuckled. Yep, that's how shine always works. It's a dog that bites back. For the first time since we'd found ourselves in this predicament, I laughed. For real! Chapter 11 When the subject of us and Gary's disappearance appeared to be closed and a half dozen attempts to speak to them failed, we decided to walk around town until people started showing up to the party. I brought him up to speed on what had happened in Keyhole Lake over the last year. We're a small town, located, surprise, on a keyhole-shaped lake. The town wraps around the round part of it, which makes us a prime location for tourists looking to go boating, swimming, or camping. I assume Hank's still sheriff. He curled his lip like he'd just eaten something bad. Nope, I said, popping the P at the end. He finally got his just desserts over the 4th of July weekend this summer, I snickered. Sometimes I crack me up. Gary wasn't as amused as I was, since he had no idea what I was talking about, so I explained. He was poisoned by a mixed berry pie, fell dead as a doornail right in his plate of barbecue. Well, ain't that just some of the best news ever? He scratched his whiskers and grinned. I always hoped he'd come to a sticky end. Okay, that was pretty good, even for an old guy. Did they find who did it? I shuddered, not because I was queasy thinking about Hank being killed, but because, due to a weird series of events, Noel and I were almost killed too. They did, I said, and left it at that. We walked in silence for a while, just admiring the decorations. I was playing our problem over in my head, trying to figure out a way to get us out of the mess we were in. 
It started snowing while we were in the town square, those big, fluffy flakes, and I admired how pretty they looked as they settled on the colored lights wrapped around the fence that surrounded the park. The town Christmas tree located in the center of the park twinkled with thousands of multicolored lights, and the nativity scene looked peaceful situated between the tree and the fence. After a while, he said, You know, this may not be any of my business. I hate it when people say that, because they're usually right. But you don't have it as bad as you think you do. Being locked in that snow globe gave me time to ponder, to put things in perspective. Just like you tend to do, I was focusing on what I didn't have instead of what I did. He seemed lost in thought as we made the circle around the park, passing businesses with windows decorated for the annual Christmas contest. I admired the huge tree in the center from all angles and tried to pick out the ornaments that we'd made for it. Sure, I lost Melody, and it was horrible. But I still had my daughter, and a niece, and nephew. More importantly, I lost sight of the fact that my daughter lost her mama. I wasn't there for her because I was too lost in myself. And I disappeared right before Christmas when I should have been trying to make things good for her. Instead, I made them a ton worse. He glanced over at me. You're the same. You complain all the time about how bad you have it, but you really don't. You still have your aunt, in some form anyway. Noel works like a dog to put food on the table and make sure you have nice things. When was the last time she bought herself a $200 pair of boots. I thought back to the Cheyennes she'd given me for my birthday a couple months ago. I blushed. Rather than being grateful for the boots, I'd been a little disappointed because I didn't get the $80 blingy belt to go with them. Not for a long time, I guess, I replied, feeling like a real troll as I thought of the $40 knockoffs she just bought herself because she'd already shoo-gooed her old ones twice. He nodded. Yeah, but do you think she regrets giving you those? No, because that's what being mature is about, willingly taking care of the people who depend on you, even if it means sacrificing sometimes in order to see them smile. As if he'd read my mind, he continued. She was putting your laundry away the other day and told your aunt she wished she could have afforded the belt too, because she knows you really wanted it, just so you know. Wow. Could I be any more horrible? He elbowed me. Don't kick yourself. Just do better. You're at a tough age, but it's time to start thinking about somebody other than just Shelby. Now that he'd put that into my mind, I couldn't stop thinking. Noelle's boots, the t-shirt I'd bought for Ray for Christmas, then decided to keep because I liked it. I gasped my best friend popping into her living room, topless, in front of her mom, and the head of the witches' council, apparently missing part of her hair, too. Everything snapped painfully into focus. Addie was right. I acted like a spoiled little kid. I needed to get back because I had some making up to do, but it seemed like we were going to need a miracle to make that happen. Chapter 12 By the time we strolled back to Bobby's, the place was full. There were several kids, including Bobby and Earl's adopted son, Justin, racing around in front of the store and lobbing snowballs at each other, laughing and talking good-natured smack. Inside, most of the adults were all decked out with blinking Christmas bulb necklaces, Santa hats, or reindeer ears, ready for the ugliest sweater contest later. And boy, was there some serious competition. Earl was already in his Santa costume, making his way toward his throne with a bag of presents over his shoulder. As always, a place had been built where the salad bar used to be until Bobby Sue had watched a documentary on sneeze guards. Noel, Sarah, and Bobby had done a great job making Santa's throne and building a wonderland behind him using white sparkling fabric with lights, presents, and even a cardboard gingerbread house. 
A wave of sadness washed over me as I realized I was supposed to help. We'd planned to make Christmas cookies before we came, then drink punch and sing Christmas carols while we decorated, just like we'd done last year. Noelle was arranging snacks on the table, and I noticed the worry lines around her eyes. She wandered over to the checkout counter where we'd each hung our stocking, and she ran her fingers over the one with my name on it. A single tear ran down her cheek. I walked up to her and tried to lay my hand on her shoulder, but of course, it passed right through her. Ray came up beside her and hugged her for me. Any word yet from Aurora or Camille about what we can do to get her back? No shook her head. What are we going to do, Ray? She's so young. What if there are terrible things in there with her? What if we don't get her back? My heart ached because I'd done this. If I'd just listened and let them do what was best, we probably wouldn't be in this mess. Sure, Gary had thrown a wrench in the works, but if I'd waited, no doubt Aurora, Camille, Noel, and Ray would have put together a spell with enough forethought and craft that it would have gotten us all out. I didn't hear Ray's reply because Gary grabbed my arm and pointed to where Santa Earl was sitting. There was a little blonde girl with giant blue eyes sitting on his lap. That's her. That's my Bonnie. We rushed over just as Earl asked her what she wanted for Christmas. I know you can't give me what I really want, she said in a small voice. Her little head bowed so that we could barely hear. So I guess just anything will do. I've been a good girl. But I thought I was a good girl last year, too. But Mommy went to be an angel. Then Daddy went away, too. Earl heaved a big sigh and looked at Bobby Sue, unsure what to say. He wasn't much for emotions on a good day, and this situation put him clear out of his depth. Bobby shrugged helplessly, her eyes shining with tears. Just then, Sherry Lynn floated in, all dressed up like Santa's helper in a little red costume with white fur trim and white cocoa boots. The skirt was a little short, but she tended to drift a little toward the risque side of the dress code. Considering she'd been a dancer in life, pole, not ballet, she was dressed conservatively, all things considered. She glided up to us and looked at Bonnie. Why's that little angel so sad, Shelby? She's breaking my heart. I started to answer, then realized that she'd talked to me. I spun around to face her. Sherry, you can see me? Chapter 13 She looked at me, confused. Well, of course I can see you. You can see me, right? She patted down her outfit and checked her hair. Why wouldn't I be able to see you? Sherry, this is important. Can you see the man with me? Sherry looked over at him and her eyes grew round. Holy sheep Moses! Gary Rossi, where on earth have you been for the last year? She narrowed her eyes. Shame on you, up and disappearing on that young'un without so much as a by your leave. She's been adrift as a kite in a hailstorm, and poor Sarah, she's been working her fingers to the bone to put food in their bellies. Gary hung his head, and I could see the resemblance between him and his daughter. I didn't mean to. Somehow I managed to curse myself into a snow globe and had no idea how to get back out. He motioned toward me with his head. Shelby here did the same thing to her and Cody, but she managed to magic them out. I grabbed hold, but she only planned on taking the two of them out, so she and I got stuck in the in-between. She looked at me, curious, then looked closer. What's he mean, the in-between? I shrugged and gave her the book example that Camille used. But then why can I see you, if Addie can't? I bit my lip right as Noelle slipped by, carrying more finger foods. 
I don't know, but will you catch her right now and have her meet us in the kitchen? Ray, too? Of course, sweetie pie. Give me two shakes. I looked at Gary, excited. This may be our miracle. But how does Sherry Lynn being able to see us get us any closer to being free? I scowled at him. If nothing else, we have somebody who can communicate for us. That's more than we had five minutes ago. True that, he said, as Noah and Ray pushed the doors open to follow us into the back. As soon as we were back there, Noelle started firing off questions and looking around, frantic to see me for herself. Shelby, are you okay? Are you there alone? She looked at Sherry Lynn. Is she okay? Is there anybody with her? Sherry sighed. This ain't working, sugar. You need to talk to one of us or the other. Talk to her. I'll tell you the answers. Shelby? You can see and hear her fine as frog's hair, right? I nodded. All right, then. To answer you, Noel, she looks fine, and she's got Gary Rossi with her. Gary Rossi? Ray asked. Who's Gary Rossi? Ray hadn't been there earlier for the conversation, so Noel started to bring her up to speed. Sherry Lynn beat her to it. He's Sarah's uncle, the one who up and dumped poor little Bonnie on her. Sherry had become a member of our little pack since she'd been murdered several months before and loved us all. She was giving him the stink eye something fierce. He didn't mean to, Sherry Lynn, and trust me, he regrets it. He's been stuck inside a snow globe for a year. He was sad, missing his wife, and wished they were one of the couples skating on the ice. Then, bam, he was in there and couldn't get out. It's not like he's been in the Bahamas. Sherry Lynn relayed the information. Wait a minute, Noel said. He was stuck in your snow globe? She narrowed her eyes. Just exactly what could he see while he was sitting on a shelf in your bedroom? Gary sighed, exasperated. Why does everybody automatically go there? It's not like I'm some pervy, creepy elf on a shelf. I couldn't see anything unless she looked directly into it. And even then, the magic in the globe kept her from seeing me anywhere other than on the bench. So... Don't worry, she didn't see anything weird either. I arched a brow at him. What weird things were you doing in my snow globe? He pinched his nose. For the love of God, Shelby, you two are messed up as a mud fence in a rainstorm. Knock it off. Sherry Lynn had been watching the exchange, smiling. Noel interrupted. I don't know what you're smiling about, but please... Feel free to share with the class. Okay, she said, waving Noel off. Shelby, that's how Cody said you guys ended up in there, too. You made the same wish, right? Yeah, but with slightly different intentions. I wanted to be in a world where it was just the two of us. No rules, no counsel, nobody to boss us. Noelle waited for Sherry Lynn to explain, then closed her eyes for a minute. Okay, so this seems to be a spell of intent. It's not a passive spell. It was placed there specifically as a means to trap people or buy somebody who was really desperate. Then the magic clung. She turned to Sherry Lynn. We need to talk to Camille and Aurora. And Shelby... Don't try anything. It's you going off half-cocked that got you into this mess. Just wait. Before Sherry could say a word, I said, I'm perfectly happy to let them do it. I'm over the whole I'm a big girl now thing. I just want whoever can fix this to do it. Your mouth to God's ears, Sherry said, then relate it to Noah and Ray. We'll be right back. I'm just going to call Aurora and Camille. We left the kitchen and rushed through the restaurant, then skidded to a stop as Levi, who'd been lying under the table, eating bits of pork from Bobby Sue's fingers, came running toward us. Bonnie saw him and her eyes lit up. 
Levi! Her gaze darted around the room, frantic to see the one face that wasn't in the crowd. Daddy? Daddy, are you here? Chapter 14 Gary rushed toward her, but as he tried to gather her up, his arm slipped right through her. His gaze was agonized as he turned toward me. We've got to do something. He looked from me to Sherry Lynn to Ray. You guys have to figure out how to get us out of here. Sarah had seen the dog and heard Bonnie's cry. She was by her side in an instant and looked up at us. Her eyes settled on Gary, and if looks could kill, he'd have been dead where he stood. You, after abandoning her for a year, you just waltz right back in here and expect to pick her up and sit her on Santa's knee? Over my dead body! She raced over and picked up a bewildered Bonnie. Who are you talking to, Sarah? Did you see that little dog? He looks just like Levi. Since we were only about ten feet from them, Sarah was looking back and forth between me and Gary. Shelby, I'm so happy to see you. Noelle told me what happened, but she didn't tell me you made it back safe. By now, Noelle and Ray were as bum-fuzzled as Gary and I were, and Bonnie was struggling to get down so that she could chase the dog. Sherry Lynn seemed to be the only one with enough clarity to take control of the situation. Sarah, honey, take Bonnie to Bobby Sue for a few minutes. We need to talk. Still glancing back and forth between the five of us, Sarah nodded and did as she asked. It only took her a minute to hand her over to Bobby Sue, who led her over to the chocolate fountain. Sarah made it back to us in double time. Now, would somebody mind telling me what in the name of little green apples is going on here? Sherry Lynn took the lead again and gave her the rundown. Her face paled as the story progressed. So, let me get this straight. You and I are the only ones who can see and hear them? Sherry nodded, and Sarah turned to Noah and Ray. And you two can't? Nope. Not so much as a shadow or a peak. Rayanne said. So, Sarah said, never taking her eyes off of Gary. You never left us, at least, not on purpose? Never, sweetheart. I was a horrible father after Melody died, but I would have never up and left Bonnie, or you and Sean. Sarah's chin quivered, but she squared her shoulders. What do we need to do to get them out? Noel? You've been talking to Camille, right? What does she say? She says nobody's ever come back from the in-between. What in blue blazes is the in-between? Noelle explained it again, but I was really getting tired of being stuck between pages one and two. I can't believe we're this close and there's no solution. Tell Noelle I said so. Tell her and Ray they're two of the most powerful witches I know, and that I know they can do it. Sherry Lynn did, but then I felt bad when No's face fell. I'd meant to be inspiring, but I think I just put more pressure on her. What if we never came out? She'd blame herself. Tell her I know this is my fault. I was a snotty, irresponsible, cocky brat, and if there's not a way to fix this, then it's not her fault. Sarah repeated what I said, but it didn't appear to make Noelle feel any better. Sherry Lynn was looking at Sarah as if she were working a puzzle. Why do you reckon we can see them when nobody else can? Noelle chimed in. There's only one thing you two have in common. Sherry, your BB had the sight, right? The ghostly go-go elf nodded, then added, She had the gift. Said she could walk between the realms, whatever that means. Noelle turned to Sarah. And you have a touch of psychic talent, too, right? A touch? She said. I've never really done anything with it. Noelle's face was twisted in concentration. Then she turned and strode toward the front door. 
Follow me. I think I have an idea, or at least an idea for an idea. Sure, that cleared things right up. Chapter 15 Outside, it had gotten completely dark except for all the Christmas lights strung around town. The snow hadn't stopped falling, and a soft blanket of it coated the rooftops and tipped the trees. The moon hung full and beautiful, crystal blue, in that way it can only look when it's really cold outside. The stars glowed and twinkled along with the Christmas lights, and I thought how much better it looked than the snow globe. Noelle called for Addie, and it only took my aunt a second to pop in. What? Belle and I were getting ready to come in and sing a couple of carols with y'all. Why are you outside? This is more important than caroling, Noelle said, waving her hand. Can you see Shelby and a guy standing right there? Ray motioned toward us. Addie looked straight at us and frowned. If that's supposed to be funny, young lady, you missed the mark by a long shot. No, I'm not trying to be funny. Sherry Lynn and Sarah can see them. She brought Addie up to speed right as Camille popped in. Let me get this straight, Camille said. We have two women who both have at least a touch of the gift, though walking between the worlds usually only applies to the world of the living and the world of the dead. There's a chasm in between, which is where Shelby and this Gary guy are. But I still don't understand why anybody, living or dead, can see them, because they're neither. Noelle shook her head. That can't be. They have to be one or the other. Addie nodded and crossed her arms. I agree. Not to get all hippy-dippy, but you're either kicking or you're not. She pointed to Camille, then at herself. You are. I'm not. Ain't no in-between there. I agree, said Sherry Lynn. I've been both. Miss Addie's right. Ain't no maybe about it. So what do we do to pull these two? She motioned toward us with her thumb out of the butt crack of existence. Sarah had been quiet up until then, but she stepped forward. Sherry Lynn, have you tried touching either one of them? No, she answered. Actually, I haven't, but they look solid to me, just like other ghosts look. Living people look different. They look normal to me, too, solid as everybody else looks to me. Sherry Lynn floated over and touched my shoulder, pulling her hand back like she'd been burned when she actually touched me. When the shock wore off after a second, she squealed, then moved back in and scooped me into a hug. I could actually smell her candy and jasmine perfume as I hugged her back. But does this mean I'm dead then? I asked, a little scared. Sherry pointed to Sarah, who was hugging Gary. I don't think so. Okay, then, Camille said. I've never in my almost three hundred years seen anything at all like this, since I can't see them. Sherry Lynn's whole demeanor suddenly changed. She shushed Camille as she turned to look at something behind her. Don't matter if you can see them or not, Addie said, as she stared over her shoulder in the same direction Sherry was, eyes wide, then dropped to one knee. Because... Unless I'm sorely mistaken, we're about to get the miracle we've been praying for. Even I could feel the change. It was like a huge storm was coming. The hairs on my arms stood up and my ears popped. Sherry Lynn and Sarah had their eyes closed, and their faces looked all peaceful. A pinpoint of light appeared and grew as it came closer. As the voices inside the restaurant lifted high and clear, singing about angels playing near the earth, the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen stepped out of the blinding light, wearing what looked like a white toga with a golden filigreed belt and circlet. Her blonde hair flowed to her waist, and the light behind her made it look like spun gold. Gary gasped as she stopped within a few feet of us, and a tear rolled down his cheek. Melody? 
She rolled her shoulders in a magnificent pair of white feathered golden wings spread out behind her. Yes, sugar, she nodded and smiled at him in a way that made me think she didn't know how to frown. You've been lost for so long. Now it's time to go take care of our little girl. She turned to me. And you, Shelby, you have a place in this world, an important one, which is one of the reasons I'm here. But first, you need to accept that you have only started your journey and you have much to learn. I started to drop to my knees as Addie had done because, well, holy jeez, there was an honest-to-God angel standing in front of me. She smiled at me and touched my shoulder. The Flynn witches are powerful. You are not meant to kneel to any being. But you do need to learn what your place is in this moment in time. Bow your head in humility and embrace your destiny. Your power is a gift meant for good. Remember that. She turned back to Gary, who was drinking her in with his eyes, tears streaming down his face. Her gaze turned wistful, and she laid her hand on his face. I'll be waiting on you, but a lifetime will pass before we see each other again. Find happiness and fill Bonnie's world with joy. For both of us. She looked at Sherry Lynn and Sarah. Ready, ladies? Sherry looked at Sarah. You know what to do? Weirdly enough, I do now. Shelby, Gary, take our hands, Sherry Lynn said, as she and Sarah moved to stand face to face, leaving enough room between them for us to stand. We did as they asked when they closed their eyes. I had the strangest feeling of being lifted off my feet. Gary and I were literally floating, but it felt like we were being balanced and guided. Each time we'd float a little too close to either of the girls, it was like we'd hit a wall. The only directions open to us were up and down. The beginning strains of It Came Upon a Midnight Clear drifted out to us, the voices of our friends and neighbors blending, each note hanging on the cold night air in near-perfect harmony. Goosebumps raced down my arms as everything around me snapped into sharper focus. When that happened, Sherry and Sarah smiled and nodded at Melody, and she placed a hand on each of their shoulders. As the final strains of the carol played out, the light grew so bright that I had to shut my eyes, and even though I still felt the floating feeling, it was as if Sherry Lynn was pushing us and Sarah was pulling us. The chill air brushed my cheek. The light winked out and the feeling of floating went away, and time was suspended for a minute as I looked around. Were we back? After a split second, Noelle and Ray pounced on me, squealing, even though they're never squealers, and hugging me. Sarah ran to Gary and pulled him in for one, too. I thanked Sherry Lynn and Sarah for what they'd done. Sugar, Sherry Lynn said. That wasn't any of our doing. We just somehow knew what she wanted us to do and did it. Make no mistake, that's a real-life blessing you just got. I shivered feeling the cold for the first time since we'd been outside. The crowd inside Bobby Sue's burst into Deck the Halls, and suddenly I couldn't wait to be among them. We made our way inside the restaurant. The decorations seemed cheerier and the lights twinkled a little brighter as I caught my first glimpses of the smiling faces of the people I loved. Chapter 16 It was warm inside, and little Bonnie was sitting on Santa Earl's lap, singing jingle bells with a cookie in each hand and melted chocolate on her face. Everybody looked toward the door as we blasted them with cold air, and her little hands went slack, dropping both cookies as she saw who was walking beside us. She scrambled off Earl's lap and ran across the room as fast as her short legs could carry her, then stopped a little bit in front of us, staring. Gary bent down and opened his arms, and she jumped the few feet to him. He swung her up and buried his face in her hair, squeezing her, smiling and crying at the same time. I guess, thinking about it, he'd had a pretty big day. 
He'd been sucked out of a snow globe, dropped between pages one and two, found out his wife was an angel, then got to hold his little girl for the first time in a year. The guy had a right to be a little emotional, all things considered. After all the hugs and fussing were done and over with, I called Cody. He'd worked late at the clinic with Will, but came over as soon as he heard my voice. As soon as he got there, after hugging me so hard I thought I was going to break, he made me promise never to wish we were anywhere else again. I gladly obliged. I was happy right where I was, and was ready to admit I didn't know nearly as much as I thought I did. I was just grateful that, for some reason, the universe had seen fit to send me a Christmas miracle when I surely hadn't earned one. I went into the bathroom to change out of the horrid red ski suit, and Noel followed me. As I pulled off my ratty sleep shirt, that's what I'd been wearing when I'd wished us into the snow globe, Noel grabbed me by the arm so hard she sunk her nails into me. I scowled and tried to pull away from her. Sorry, she said, but look. I tried to twist around to see what she was pointing at, but couldn't. She pulled her compact out of her purse and I backed up close to the mirror. There, right where Melody had touched me on my right shoulder, was an inch-high reddish-brown mark shaped like a perfect pair of angel wings. Epilogue an attractive couple sat at one of the cafe tables at Brew for You, sipping lattes and watching the holiday activities going on in the town square. It seems to be a quaint little town, he said to her. She nodded once. It does. I'd love to give that barbecue place over there a go. Her stomach rumbled as she peered at the sign. He followed her gaze, then took another sip of his coffee. Do you think we'll have any trouble adapting? So far, we've fared well, she said, shrugging. These people seem to be especially forgiving when we make errors, though I do wonder what a Yankee is. They seem to use the term mostly when we've committed a social blunder. Maybe it just means foreigner, he said. They seem inordinately determined to point out that we're not from these parts. Perhaps we should focus on learning the local dialect and rules of conduct. She hummed, agreeing. We'll need to find employment and a place to live. I saw a sign when we entered announcing this shop is looking for a barista. I assume that means somebody who makes coffee. It's not a term that was in use in our day, but it can't be too difficult. What would you like to do? You're skilled with animals, but the horse and carriage seems to have been replaced by those automated vehicles. I don't know he said, eyeing a passing pickup with a wreath attached to the grill with interest. I'm not particular. Perhaps I can secure a position in the building sector. That can't have changed much. After all, a hammer is a hammer. Or I could learn to repair those vehicles. If it's mechanical, it breaks. Smiling, she placed her hand over his. It doesn't matter what we do, as long as we're together. He lifted one corner of his mouth in a loving half-smile. I'm content wherever you are, love, as long as you never ask me to ice skate again. This has been Witching for a Miracle, written by Tegan Meyer, narrated by Merritt North, copyright 2018 by Tegan Meyer, production copyright 2019 by Tegan Meyer.